Welcome back, friends, to the Presidential Speculatainment Podcast. Uh, this episode, we are going to cover some very pertinent things. Um, namely, we're going to revisit the Republican candidates for President of the United States for the election which is to be held in November of 2016. So it is way early on, you might say, um, in comparison. In fact, that's about 18 months away. And so why are we even talking about this? Well, the announcements uh, have, have been happening. It's not as if uh, the culture has decided that presidential politics is suddenly what we should all um, discuss. But I, I might say that culture here in America, in ancient civilizations, or wherever, is, is uh, merely a reaction to our given reality and uh, our society and our everyday life. And it just so happens that as I was walking down the street not so long ago, uh, I overheard an AM station coming out of a pickup truck just blasting over the airwaves. And so I will run for president now. Okay, that last anecdote is not... That was an embellishment. Okay, I, I did not hear that in that in that setting but nonetheless if you happen to pick up a physical newspaper or turn on network television news um etc you'll notice that these prominent figures um in in our american society they have made it public information that they're going to run for president so as your host, me, Dan Winslow, here at Presidential Speculatainment, I have a duty to react, okay? This is not an aggressive action, folks. This is merely re-reporting what has already been made known to the public. Uh, you can also check out some of that information at presidentialspeculatainment.com. But this week, here on the podcast, we are going to specifically cover uh, the Republican candidates, or at least a couple of them. Uh, we mentioned the entire list on the last episode, podcast number one. Um, but we're, we're just going to break that down a little bit more for you. Also, we're going to briefly give you an update on what happened in the election down in Mexico. So, sit back and enjoy. Alrighty, folks. So, where to begin? I say we begin in Mexico. A recent election was decided down in the U.S. of A.'s neighboring country, Mexico. And a little interesting story that has been broken throughout the news cycles, which is, uh, I guess they, they have gubernatorial elections for each state of Mexico. And... I'm reporting here to you that the very first independent has been elected uh, in a Mexican gubernatorial election. This is regarding uh, the northernmost state of Mexico, known as Nuevo León, uh, which which you know is a border state of Mexico, and. Uh, it, it had previously been uh, presided over by uh, somebody in uh, the Mexican President's Party. That would be the PRI Party. 
uh, the president being uh, Presidente Enrique uh, Niet- uh, Niet- Nieto. I think it's Nieto, right? And he's in the PRI party, otherwise known as the Institutional uh, Revolution Party. Which, by the way, a bit of an oxymoron. Revolu- uh, institutional Revolution. Right? I mean, it's kind of like saying, oh, next week uh, is the official commence, uh, uh, commissioning of, of a brand new bureau, uh, the Bureau of Rebellion. All rebels, uh, please report uh, to the bureaucratic premises, uh, show up, and uh, fill out your, your card, right? All your information, and you will be tallied into the system and be notified as to when the next uh, rebel rebellion uh, event, uh, as sanctioned by the Bureau, uh, will will be held. Right? Anyways, uh, this is the predominant party in Mexico. The last I checked, they uh, got about a 40%... Um, vote in in their uh, governing body, like our Congress, right? But this is because they have more parties in in Mexico. 40% is is the most. So um, PRI, as it looks, is going to maintain um, or, or even grow their influence down in Mexico. In any case, PRI failed to maintain the northern state of Nuevo León because uh, there was uh, an upset election and the PRI incumbent was defeated by independent Jaime Rodriguez. That's right, folks. He's otherwise known as uh, El Bronco or in English... The Bronco. So I, I just thought that that was fitting to report. After all, his nickname is after a horse. And what better analogy to the U.S. presidential election cycle uh, than a guy who likens himself to a horse? Because this is the, just a, a contest of speed and agility much like uh, a derby, really. So that's what's going on down there. Uh, I don't have any more information for you at that uh, juncture right now. Um, I do know also uh, the UK just had elections. And it's much different over there. You know, they they don't campaign until a, a month or two before the elect, you know, before the voting day. It's it's much much different over there in the other English speaking dominant country of the world. Um, here in America, we begin very early on speculating as to uh, who's in the race, what they're going to do, and that is exactly what we are going to do this time on this episode for you folks. So, where to begin? with the Republican candidates for president. I have a small disclosure, um, just for your interests. I don't want to be anything less than forthcoming about this. Okay, guys, I consider myself a Texan, all right? I was born in Texas and raised in Texas, all right? So I, j- I just wanted to get that out there. Okay, so you guys know where I'm coming from. But I, I did think that that was important to mention because in the Republican field of candidates, there's already a small handful of Texans, all right? So it just so happens that I'm, I'm reporting about that. So I needed to get that out of the way. Uh, but first and foremost... I picked up the paper, right, um, a couple days ago, and here I see 
that who else is running for president but Rick Perry. All right, Rick Perry, uh, he succeeded uh, George W. Bush as the governor of Texas, longest governor in Texas ever, um, went through the uh, Second Great Depression of 08, whatever they're calling it, and uh, proceeded to govern Texas as it became, whatever, the least unemployed state uh, dur- during the quote-unquote Great Recession, or, or however they're measuring it. Yeah, it's a, supposedly an economic success. Um, there is some truth to that. Uh, as the economy in, in the major cities, at least of, of Texas, are faring well compared to other economies around the country. And so Rick Perry, you know, he's he's uh, uh, feeling, you know, quite bubbly about this. So he's running again. And, uh, you know, I think we believe in redemption. We believe in second chances. Here in uh, the U.S. of A. I'm not going to speak for everybody. But uh, he is running again. And I did read that. And I'll tell you what my reaction was. It was not a big, big reaction. Because just my opinion here. Rick Perry is not that big of a deal. He is not a big deal. Okay? And if I was going to try and sum him up in in one small phrase i would say that rick perry is like george w bush 0.5 that's right 0.5 it's not an upgrade no 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 because he's got similarities to w okay he's uh he's got a bit of a drawl right He's kind of a, a straight shooter, if you will. He likes to, um, you know, make small talk and mingle with the voting public, you know, and kiss babies. But guys, it, it's a major step down from Bush. Because Bush was the full-blown real deal. I mean, he, he was the West Texas gabber. Right out on the campaign trail, and uh, you know those babies back in oh uh, four, back in two thousand, who got kissed by W. I mean, they were changed forever. And uh, Rick Perry, uh, you know, it's it's kind of like a sequel, but it just pales in comparison. It's not as over the top as as the real deal, which was W. Right. So I don't know. It, it's tough for me to really give him a, a serious look because he just has a very tough act to follow. Right. America already tried that out. They already said, all right, we're going to go with the uh, with the old time Western gunslinger. You know, uh, he's just a simple man. Uh, and we tried that. And actually, we experienced that for eight years. And I, I'm not sure that a more subdued, less cartoonish version of that is going to be notable. So that's my take on Rick Perry. Not that big of a deal. Um, that brings me to Marco Rubio, right? He is running... He was one of the first guys in there. Now, he's a youngin, okay? Um, Don't quote me on this, but I think he's about 41, all right? And by the way, everybody, um, according to our founding documents, uh, and the Constitution uh, notes that you have to be 35 years of age or older to run for president. There's different rules for different offices, right? But that's the minimum because I don't know why, right? You, you open your history books, okay? Maybe they wanted a certain amount of a wisdom. In any case, uh, Rubio is going for it. 
the Senate, this would be the uh, junior senator out of Florida, right? He was elected in uh, um, 2010. He also said that he's not seeking re-election in the Senate in Florida, right? This is unlike Rand Paul, by the way, also running for president, uh, sen- uh, junior senator from Kentucky, right? Also elected in 2010. Rand Paul said that he is seeking the presidency, but if he doesn't get it, he's also seeking re-election to Senate in uh, Kentucky in 2016, right? Marco Rubio uh, says, no, no, no. I'm not going for re-election in Florida. I'm going all in on the presidency. Uh, And so that's that, you know? So there you have it, right? But I, I, I don't really, I don't know what he's doing. I mean, he's a young guy, right? Uh, but he's given up on the Senate. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, he's uh, potentially going up against Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida. And I don't know, man, That that is a lofty task. Now, Jeb Bush has not officially declared he's running for president. Uh, it, it is heavily rumored, okay? But if he does, uh, I mean, where is Marco Rubio going to get his donors? Uh, to me, it seems like uh, he's going to be uh, worked into quite a, quite a sweat. And if you didn't get that reference, just look up on... Uh, on a video um, search engine, uh, Marco Rubio, you know, State of the Union, and you will see that, you know, he's he's got um, very, some very active sweat glands, and I personally I compliment him on that. I say, you know what? That's a, that's a great job. Well done. We're one of the few species who can sweat. And, you know, the more you sweat, then the more, you know, in and out with the water. It's like you're constantly uh, replenishing. So no reason to hate on the guy. Um, but I don't know. It, it seems like he's really uh, playing the ace card in quite a gamble. So could this just be practice for, you know, 2024? I, I don't really know. And again, that's why we're calling it speculatainment. In any case, uh, so Jeb Bush, though, he's not officially running, heavily rumored to be running. I, I did happen to mention, because I do, uh, I do my research around here and everything like that, uh, I happened to see a speech and an interview that Jeb Bush did at CPAC, right? This is the top conservative um, event of the year, right? Here comes Jeb Bush. Okay, and what I noticed was that he has some striking similarities to his brother, George W. Bush. Most notably, his body language. He has a certain head jerk Enus, head jerkiness, where he will kind of bobble and and jerk his head just like his brother did. And I swear to you, perhaps me describing it out loud does not do it justice. But if you saw him uh, speaking with no volume, and, and you also saw our, our former, uh, you know, president, George W. Bush, uh, speaking you would say, my God, the similarity is, is striking. So I, I definitely noticed that. Um, so th- they do say that 70% of communication is nonverbal. So I think on a subconscious level, uh, Jeb is going to have to confront the American psyche are we ready uh, for 
uh, as, as basically a very close uh, genome map to George W. Bush uh, to to take the reins. And I I can't answer that the answer that question because I'm I happen to be conscious at this moment. So you know that's just a tough one. That's a very heavy question that he's got to ponder, right? Um, but there you have it, and, and and that's that's how it goes in the in the age of you know political dynasties and such. I did happen to also catch a speech uh, made by Scott Walker uh, at CPAC, right? Now, this was the uh, Wisconsin governor. This is the Wisconsin governor speaking at CPAC, which is the conservative uh, shindig of the year, right, for 2015. Um, And, you know, he's obviously there. He's giving a speech. And he is possibly poising for a presidential run, right? Just like Jeb Bush was. Um, And, you know, as of now, Scott Walker is not confirmed for president. But I do believe that uh, him and W, his brother, Jeb, they're both going to be in the race. I mean, who's kidding who, right? So Scott Walker, he makes his speech. He did this kind of a thing when he walked out, uh, which was very Midwestern. I thought of him. Uh, he was a little too casual amongst the roaring applause. You can you can check out the video of it, but he 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 just says you know as the applause goes on and on. Uh, hi, 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 hi. Uh, comfortable. Very comfortable, if you will, kind of like W uh, doing the same thing, except, you know, just substitute howdy. Uh, But Mr. Walker, I thought, proved that he is a formidable speaker. Uh, He was quite, quite effective, I thought, when it came to delivering a speech uh, to please the conservatives. You know, he, he was... He was, he was quite good and um, very in character. I mean, I, I did a little research and it turns out that Scott Walker's dad was was a preacher, right? He was a minister. And so you might imagine that, you know, little Scott, as a kid, you know, sitting in the pews, you know, a few back from the front row, kind of taking notes, kind of... Uh, thinking to himself, gee, dad sure is uh, uh, getting a favorable rise out of all these members of my community. Uh, you know, I wonder if I could be president someday. Uh, but but he, he discussed uh, his reason why uh, he decided to run for governor of Wisconsin and of course, he described that as a decision made between uh, him and Mrs. Walker uh, with consideration of uh, their children, of course. Um, after all, I mean, can you run for president if you don't have a wife and kids, right? And uh, I wish I could say husband and kids, um, but sadly, that's still unprecedented here in, in this nation. So uh, I will just say, you know, in the in the first X number of elections, you know, the uh, as part of the requirements, you gotta have a, a wife and kids. Uh, there might be a couple presidents out there in the past uh, with no wife or no kids, um, but I would I would I would gander that that is less than three on both accounts. And in fact, I promise you, folks. On the next podcast, I will have the answer to that for you. Have we ever had a president in the United States that was not married when he ran for president to a wife and that did not have any children? Okay, so tune in to episode three to find that out. In any case, Scott Walker declares that his decision to run for governor of Wisconsin 
uh, was due to the fact that uh, he felt compelled to do so because the state was in a disarray and it really needed help from somebody. And again, let me tell you folks, uh, that's exactly what I'm talking about when I said that he did a formidable job of the whole public speaking thing. Uh, he hit all the right emotional notes and, um, you know, he, he Scott Walker uh, made himself a hero on that day. Uh, now, if you want my opinion, which I hope that you do, Scott Walker is, and still impressively so, in my mind, I'm giving him compliments here, he is an excellent politician. <laughs> because uh, such is the art of politics. Uh, you know, and why, why did he decide to run for governor anyhow? Um, I'm guessing that it some, had something else to do. Uh, maybe with some, some benefits, some perks, some rides in private jets, some uh, conference meetings where he got to sit in the best chair. I mean, Scott Walker has the look of a guy who likes the thrills and one thing that doesn't get mentioned on network news is that politics is all about the thrills. Uh, so, but that's okay, you know. If Scott Walker wants to get his kicks. I say let him, okay. And he's 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 uh, one of the better ones out there doing it. Um, Obama is up there, I would say. A th- he's a thrill seeker. I mean, you can just read his his book. Uh, kind of his biography little book. I, I didn't read it, but um, he talks about, you know, he liked to do that when he was growing up in Hawaii, go out and seek some some thrills, some fast times. And is it any different? Is it any different when you start gunning for higher office? I say no, and I say we're all okay with that in America. All right? So we're going to tr- call a spade a spade here. All right, Scott, so we'll be looking for your announcement. Be sure to check back here on the podcast uh, after he possibly does announce. All right, so that brings us to uh, Ted Cruz, right? And this is the last guy I'm just going to mention, and then we'll we'll wrap it up uh, for this time. Because, trust me, this is going to go on. And anyways, Ted Cruz... Senator from Texas, a uh, Tea Party guy, um, out of step with his party. He has been called uh, uber conservative um, and, and that type of stuff. Uh, he, I guess, he was admittedly born in Canada to an American mother. Uh, I mean, United States born mother so I'm, I'm actually i'm not sure how that's gonna work okay again check back later um but anyways um so all, all the creepiness aside of of ted cruz right because he does have kind of a um kind of a smooth syrupy way that he deliberates what he says and uh, I'm not sure that, you know, if I was in a third grade classroom and he was coming to talk to me on career day, I'm not sure, you know, whether I would just 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 stay sat cross-legged in my spot and just pee my pants or whether I would try and jump out the window. I don't know that answer, um, but I, I will tell you one thing. About Ted Cruz and the presidency uh, to be claimed in November 2016. And that is Ted Cruz is not in shape to be the next president. That's right. I, I said it. I said it. Ted Cruz is too out of shape to be the next president. And you might be thinking, well, well, Ted's not even that out of shape. 
I mean, considering some of the other names that have been have been tossed out there or tossed into the ring. But I, I, I uh, urge you, take a second look. Take a second look, my friends. Look at Mr. Cruz and observe his outfits, his fashion choices, and the way that his fine clothes are tailored to his body. And if you observe closely, you'll see something truly remarkable, which is that this man is in no shape to survive any century prior to the 21st century. He really, he's hiding something uh, behind that, those fine uh, materials of, uh, of dress cloth. And see for yourself, see for yourself, folks. But I, I just, I just personally, you know, I just think that it, if he's trying to um, put forth this image that he's this kind of a tough, you know, gun slinging, uh, hard knocks Texan, that doesn't that demand some some kind of physical shape? So, to that I say, Ted Cruz. If you're serious about the presidency, then get serious about some barbells and about some crunches, all right? They're no fun. You don't have to tell me that, okay? Nobody likes to do them. Uh, But then again, not everybody wants to be the president. In fact, only 14 people as of now have announced, okay? And just another statistic, just throwing it out there, roughly 30 2% or one third of America is obese. So that's a much bigger club, if you will. I mean, you could always join that one. You don't have to join the I want to be president club. Uh, And not that Ted Cruz is obese, okay? But uh, as they say in politics, he's he's flirting with a slippery slope. Um, So... There you have it. There's a few of those uh, candidates uh, for the for the Republican uh, nomination. Uh, those other candidates, you know, I, I think they're they're not quite yet worth mentioning. Okay, if they were, I'd mention them. All right, uh, Donald Trump, please run for president. Okay, please, 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 uh, because. This is, uh, in America, ultimately, ultimately, the entertainment capital of the planet. Um, and that means something to us. So, please, just get in there, all right? We got a, we got a Fox News debate uh, in August, the very first one for the Republicans. Apparently, it's going to be the, the top 10 candidates uh, based off of five national polls. Uh, so right now we're, we're we're at ten, so everyone's in. Uh, but if someone else decides to get in, then suddenly it's musical chairs. Uh, so <laughs> we'll certainly be looking at that. Uh, but it is heating up, folks. It is heating up in this campaign season, and uh, I'm not going to overkill it unless I already have. But uh, I will keep you guys informed uh, with all of the critical information uh, about this this horse race. Um, and I'm just going to do my very best. So if you'd like to know more, you know, please visit presidentialspeculatainment.com. Uh, I really hope you guys subscribe to the podcast. Um, please give it a rating or review it. Uh, that really helps out. And check out episode three. Uh, I am going to give a little more on on why I'm doing this exactly and what you can expect. Uh, But I hope we're having a little bit of fun and I will be back with some hard facts with you and with me, Dan Winslow, on Presidential Speculatainment, the podcast, next time. Until then.